In this video, we're going to spend some more time looking at the graphical relationships between displacement, velocity, and acceleration. Um, we've been doing this for a wee while now, and we're working towards our end goal, which is to actually develop some equations we can use to relate these things in practice. So last time we learned that we can calculate velocity from displacement by drawing tangent lines to displacement curves, and we can do the same thing to calculate, calculate acceleration from velocity curves. Um, so we also came up with, with some formulas that give us average velocity and average acceleration. They are things like v average is equal to delta x over delta t, and average acceleration is delta v over all the change in velocity over the change in time. Um, just by the way, in case you've ever done some calculus before, you might recognize these things as being derivatives of each other. That's just a connection that you might be able to make. If you haven't done calculus, that's totally fine. We're not worried about that in this course. So what we're going to do in today's video is we're going to learn to go back the other way. Um, how to calculate velocity from acceleration and how to calculate displacement from velocity curves. Okay, so we're going back backwards. Um, and we, again, we're going to do it using properties of graphs. So kia ora koto, I'm Richard Brown. I'm one of your biophysical principles lecturers. Okay, so let's start by seeing if we can figure out velocity as our displacement from velocity. So what we want is we've got an interval and we want to know what the overall displacement is, delta x, over that interval. So actually, let's start with a slightly simpler example. Let's just have a graph where our velocity is constant. Okay, just a constant flat velocity. We'll just say velocity is 3 meters per second. And we'll set up a time interval. Let's just say t0 is 0 seconds and tf is 5 seconds. So that gives us a delta t of 5 seconds overall. So in this case, our average velocity will also just be 3 meters per second because the velocity doesn't change. So to find out our displacement, we can just use our average velocity formula. So that formula, remember, was V average is displacement delta x over delta t. So if I rearrange that by multiplying both sides through by delta t, I'll get my displacement is equal to V average times delta t which is going to be 3 times 5, which is 15 uh, meters. So question, can you see what significance this number has in terms of looking at our graph? So think about properties of shapes. Um, when we mul multiply these two numbers together, the 3 and the 5, what kind of thing are we calculating here? So maybe pause the video for a moment and have a look um, and see if you can figure out what it means before you start it again. Okay, so welcome back. Maybe you saw that our picture, if we just sort of take away all the extra details, it just really looks like a rectangle with sides of 3 and 5. So when we multiply together two sides of a rectangle, that just gives us the area. So that number 15, our displacement, is just the area of that rectangle, base times height. So in this particular case, our displacement is just the area, or that rectangle area, underneath our graph there. Okay, that's interesting. Let's just take it up a level. Um, let's now imagine that our velocity is not constant. Imagine it starts at 1 and it increases to 8 over our 5 second interval okay, in a steady way. So our velocity versus time graph, that will now be a straight line. Now remember we're still trying to figure out our displacement overall, but now we've got a changing velocity graph. Um, a really useful thing to remember here is that if you have multiple displacements in a row, like we had an example of that in a previous video, you can always get the overall displacement by adding up the individual ones. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up with some kind of estimate of my overall displacement by splitting my 5 second interval into 5 separate pieces and I'm going to pretend that the velocity is constant in each one rather than sloped. So I'm kind of replacing my graph, straight line graph with a new one that looks a bit like a staircase. Now the advantage of doing that is for each one of those intervals I can work out the displacement by doing that rectangle area idea that I talked about before. Um, so if I work out the area of each of those rectangles and add them all up, it seems kind of reasonable that this will be some kind of estimate of my overall displacement. We're not ex expecting it to be exactly right because we're changing our graph, but maybe we get something close. So let's get to work at calculating our displacements. So for each of these intervals, I'm going to indicate on my velocity. So the first one will be 1 all the way across, then it will be 2.4, the next one will be 
then 5.2, and then 6.6. .6. Now each of those rectangles has a base of 1, um, and so the individual displacements are just going to be 1 times whatever the height is, so 1 times the velocity. So let's do that. So our displacements for each interval are delta x1 is going to therefore be 1 metre, delta x2, that'll be 2.4 metres, delta x3, or my displacement 3, is going to be 3.8 metres, uh, my fourth displacement will be 5.2 metres, and my fifth displacement will be 6.6 .6 metres. And that would make our overall displacement the sum of all those numbers, which will give us 19 metres overall. Okay, now just it's really worth stressing here that this displacement we just calculated is only an estimate because we pretended that our velocity was constant in each interval. But actually in each one of those it actually increased. So what we've probably done is underestimated our overall displacement because it was going up more than we said it was. So one way of getting a better estimate would be to divide my graph up into smaller pieces. Okay, so, and with again do that staircase idea, or, and I could kind of, you can imagine that I could make those pieces smaller and smaller and smaller until you can't really make out the staircase shape anymore. But here's the key insight. As I do that process, I'm always calculating the area of those rectangles, um, and as those intervals get really small, then what I'm sort of, my estimate is giving me is really the area underneath that graph. So if we could somehow calculate the area under the graph, then we should end up with the displacement. So if you find that idea a bit confusing, just go back again to that approximate version and imagine repeating the process with smaller and smaller and smaller intervals. And you, may, you hopefully can imagine that as my intervals get really small, I should get a number that's pretty much indistinguishable from the area underneath that graph. Okay, so we've got a nice straight line graph here. So that is something for which we could calculate the area underneath relatively easily and um, without having to do this sum of rectangles malarkey. So the area, well it's really just that triangle perched on top of a rectangle. Right, the triangle, well that has a base of 5 and a height of 7, so its area is going to be a half base times height, which would be a half times 5 times 7, which will be 17.5. And the rectangle, well that has a base of 5 and a height of 1, so the area of the rectangle is just 5. Which means our overall area underneath this curve, or this graph, is 5 plus 17.5, which will be 22.5. And what that means is that our overall displacement is going to be delta x is 22.5 metres. And unsurprisingly, it's a bit bigger than the 19 metres that we calculated before. Um, because our estimate actually left off the area of all those little wee triangles perched on top of our columns. And what we just calculated, well that was the displacement after 5 seconds. We could just as easily calculate this displacement after, for example, 3 seconds by just calculating the area underneath the graph between 0 and 3. Right, now there was the, we haven't quite covered everything we need yet, because what happens if we are moving left? Well, if we're moving left, and we jump off to the left. And we jump off to the left. Our velocity is going to be negative. And that means that as we're moving left with the negative velocity, we should expect to get negative displacements as well. Um, so areas, so as far as we're normally aware of them, they're always positive. So the way we account for this is if we have areas underneath the horizontal axis, we actually count them as negative when we do our overall calculation. So probably the easiest way to see how this works is with an example. So let's take an example where my velocity steadily decreases from 5 to negative 3 meters per second over 4 seconds. So what is my overall displacement during this time? Well, we'll start again by drawing a graph. We can see that we have a straight line connecting 5 and negative 3 and that cuts the time axis at 2.5 seconds. So we actually need to work out the areas of the two triangles individually and count that second one underneath the axis as negative area. So the first, the area of the first triangle, that's going to be again half base times height, so it'll be 0 0.5 times 2.5 times 5, uh, which will be 6.25. And the area of that second triangle is going to be a half times the base of 1.5 
times the height of 3 will be 2.25. So when we actually go and calculate our overall displacement over that 4 second interval, it's going to be delta x is the first area, 6.25, minus the second one, because it's underneath, minus 2.25. So overall, my displacement will be 4 meters. So when we work out um, areas in this way, it's called finding the signed area underneath our curve. And again, for those of you who have seen, who've done a bit of calculus before, you may know this kind of area calculation as a thing called a definite integral. But again, we do, we're not doing calculus in this course, so don't worry about it if you haven't seen that before. So one final note, what the area gives us is the overall displacement. If we want to know the final position, we'd need to know the initial position xi as well. So then we could calculate the final position as being xf equals xi plus delta x. Okay, so what we really just did was to explore a certain kind of mathematical relationship satisfied by velocity and displacement. And hopefully by this time it should no longer come as a surprise that we could do the same thing to work out velocity from acceleration um, by taking signed areas underneath acceleration graphs this time in the same way. That's because the mathematical relationship between velocity and acceleration is the same as the mathematical relationship between uh, displacement and velocity. So let's take a problem like this one. We've got a cyclist who's riding at 10 meters per second, approaching a traffic light. Now the cyclist takes a break and glides for 20 seconds just to rest her legs. And the light goes green, and so she then accelerates again over the next 10 seconds. And we can re represent the acceleration of the, uh, of the cyclist by the following graph over the interval. Okay, so we've got a negative acceleration corresponding to the slowing down over that first 20 seconds of negative 0.2. And then a positive acceleration corresponding to speeding up again um, for that final 10 seconds of 0.3 meters per second squared. Okay, so the question is what is the cyclist's velocity at 20 seconds and also at 30 seconds? Now what have we got? Well we have the initial velocity vi is 10 meters per second um, and we have the acceleration on a graph so we should be able to work out our change in velocity by looking at the signed area between our graph and the horizontal axis. So for the first question, where we want to find the displacement up to 20 seconds, we're first going to work out that area between our curve and the axis for that first 20 seconds. So that's going to be the area of that rectangle underneath the axis. Now that rectangle has an area of, well it's going to be a base of 20 times a height of 0.2, which will be 4 an area of 4 which corresponds to a velocity change of negative 4 meters per second because it's underneath the axis. So my overall change in velocity, delta v, will be uh, negative 4 meters per second. Now to work out my actual velocity, I can just use the formula that says that my final velocity is equal to my initial velocity plus the change in velocity. So my final velocity at 20 seconds will be vf equals vi plus delta v, which is going to be 10 plus negative 4, so that will give me 6 meters per, se uh, meters per second at 20 seconds. Now to find the velocity at 30 seconds, we're going to calculate the overall change in velocity over the entire interval. So this time we've got the area, that first area we just calculated, which, will be, which was 4, and now we've got a second area which is going to have be above the axis and it has a width of 10 seconds or a base of 10 seconds and a height of 0.3. So that corresponds to a change in velocity of 3 meters per second. So my overall change in velocity over the entire 30 seconds is going to be negative that first area, so negative 4 that will be, plus, because now it's above, that second area which is going to be plus 3. So my overall change in velocity is going to be negative 1 meters per second, four, uh, sorry, negative 4 plus 3. And so my final velocity will be my initial velocity of 10 plus that change in velocity of negative 1, which gives me a final velocity of 9 meters per second. Okay, so in this video we explored um, how the concept of areas under graphs can let us go backwards. Uh, so we can calculate things like velocity from acceleration or displacement from velocity.
And we can do this by working out the signed areas between the curves and the time axis. So in our next video, um, we're going to use these helpful, this helpful information to actually come up with some equations that relate all of these various things for a particular situation where the acceleration is constant over an interval. And these equations come in extremely useful, and they're called the kinematic equations. So we can have that to look forward to for next time. But in the meantime, just time to do some more practice in your workshop, and we'll see you next time. Kakite anō.